Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Monday, November 15th, 2021, and primarily for those of you listening on the podcast, because you're going to get a little better audio quality than the live video, you might hear what sounds like uh, some power tools, and no, it's not the feds or the local uh, V police trying to break in and correct things here. Just got some construction outside, but the show must go on. So on this episode, I'm continuing a series covering papers of one of the most prominent anti-federalist writers, Brutus. We're getting close to the end of these essays. I just got a couple more. Today, I'm actually covering three of them in one. In paper number 13, Brutus has issues. These are all regarding the federal judiciary, the Supreme Court. And of course, in the previous paper, he was very concerned about what he saw and what Jefferson actually saw some years later and around the same time as well as the tendency of the federal judiciary to expand and consolidate the powers of the general government into an extremely powerful central government, which I would have to say he absolutely called it because that's what we live under today, the largest government Ever. Anyway, so in paper number 13, he's got the issues with the idea of individuals suing states. Not sure if we're going to be on board with that, but let's go over his his talking points. And then number 14, he broke it down into two papers. There he has issues with appellate jurisdiction and a threat to the trial by jury. And he actually makes quite a bit of points, quite a number of points throughout these papers that end up as really the precursor to what became the Fifth and the Sixth Amendments in the Bill of Rights. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific Time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the Tenth Amendment Center. Our show homepage has everything you need to follow this show. TenthAmendmentCenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out. TenthAmendmentCenter.com slash path to liberty. There you're going to find all the archives of the show for well over three years. I think we're actually getting close to 500 episodes. I don't keep track of episode numbers, but maybe I should take a look at that. That's kind of a milestone. And on individual episodes like this one today, I publish an individual blog post somewhere between an hour to two hours after the live show is done. And that's where I include all the links and references that I mention in the show. So you can take a look and read and learn more on your own time. Uh, 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. There you're also going to find all the different platforms we're on. We live stream on the mainstream ones like YouTube and Facebook and Twitch and Twitter. We also live stream on the decentralized censorship resistant Odyssey dot com. Awesome platform. And then we're also archiving our videos at a bunch of different places. Of course, if you notice that we're not on one one morning, well, you know that we probably got booted because sooner or later they're not going to like what we have to say and they're going to throw us out. So we're on all the platforms that we can think of. Of course, Rumble and Gab TV and Minds and MeWe and BitChute and Brighty on BitTube. But we re- recently started uh, uploading all the episodes to Ben Swan's great sovereign, S-O-V-R-E-N dot media. So grateful for the work that Ben is doing over there uh, to actually provide an outlet for people to speak without fear of getting booted. So sovereign dot media. And of course, we have the podcast only edition at the all the usual suspects, of course, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Podbean, TuneIn, etc. And you can also find our membership program where you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month. Again, 10thAmendmentCenter.com slash path to liberty is where you can find that. 10thAmendmentCenter.com slash path to liberty. And before I get into the uh, details from Brutus, just a quick hello to everyone out in the live chat while we allow people a few more moments to get notifications to join us on the live stream. There's Haji, uh, 1954 in Oakland County, Michigan, Tim Martin in Arizona, Dixie Strong in Alabama, Cheriton Farmer in Missouri. Deep South Granny says, oh, Lord, I've shown up early for something. That's scary. That's cool. Well, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Clay Kent, always good to see you, buddy. Uh, Wesley Hoteline says, good morning. Watcher Someone Awake in San Jose, California in the hood. Welcome. Almost neighbors. Sharon Patriot, uh, Andy Blue, and everyone else. Thank you for being here. I apologize for anyone I missed. I will take a look in the chat a little bit later in the show or... Maybe a little bit later today and see if I can answer some questions. There's Leslie Ann as well. Thank you all for being here. And again, three papers. Brutus number 13, published on February 21st, 1788. 
14, part one on the 28th, the following week. And then third week after that, part two of, of the 14th paper, March 6th, he does, spends a lot of time and a lot of papers talking about the judiciary. Of course, the show homepage has all these episodes where you can find all the stuff all the individual episodes on the Brutus Papers. Just scroll to the bottom of that show homepage, and we're going to expand into some other anti-federalist writings after I'm done with this series. I'm thinking either Cato or maybe Federal Farmer or possibly Mercy Otis Warren, something like that. I'd be interested in what you want to hear about as well. Anyways, here from uh, Jason Mandarish over at Founder of the Day. Dot com Awesome. Short blog posts every single day about just interesting historical stuff with a heavy emphasis on people you've probably never heard of. I also follow Founder of the Day on Twitter personally, and 10th Amendment Center often shares some of that stuff as well. But here's what he has to say. Let me pull this up on the screen here. He says, after, and we're looking at the 13th paper here, after acknowledging several parts of the judicial system under the Constitution that he agrees with, Brutus comes down against the ability of individual to, individuals to sue states in federal court. He did not like the idea of individuals being able to go to a central government and say, well, this state is out of hand. You got to come and protect us. I think he thought this was degrading to the states because you're talking about a union, a confederation of free and independent states. The idea that they were subservient to the opinions of unelected, unaccountable, politically connected lawyers, he thought was bad. But I think there is also a tinge of, well, this is going to lead, if you take it in conjunction with the other papers, this was going to lead to a centralization of power. Because if the federal courts are telling us what's right and wrong by what the states do, then eventually the federal courts are going to swallow up all of those decisions. And that's what he was warning about previously. Uh, here from Paul E. McGreal, this is a 2002 law review paper at uh, Southern Methodist University, SMU. He says, first, these are the reasons that he was concerned about individuals suing states in federal court. He says, first, Brutus argued that federal power to hear private suits against the sovereign states offended their dignity. Quote, this is humiliating and degrading to a government. I mean, I like the idea of humiliating and degrading a government because they're all pretty evil. Maybe back then it was expected to be far less evil or the hopes were they would be. But uh, these days, all the governments at every level in every state are just horrible. Some are less bad on some issues. Sometimes some are good on some issues, but overall, just awful. So he thought it was very humiliating, degrading. And Brutus continues and he says, and what I believe the supreme authority of no state ever submitted to. Now he's using the term state as a nation. We think of states as kind of semi-independent-ish uh, bodies in a, a larger nation, but really the notion of free and independent states, what Samuel Adams referred to in his great uh, speech uh, uh, announcing or supporting the Declaration of Independence, we looked at each of these as sovereign countries, sovereignty of the people of the several states. Anyways, the number two thing that Paul points out, Brutus specifically addressed the problem of state debts held by out-of-state speculators. And here from Jason over at uh, Founder of the Day, Brutus feared these notes could easily be sold to individuals in neighboring states who would then immediately turn them around because it was common for states to take out debt from individual citizens and in return, he writes, give them notes promising to repay the loan similar to the government bonds we had today. This was very common, especially when, during the Revolutionary War and the years after when states were very desperate to pay for that. We had all kinds of fiat paper currency and things like that. Here's how Brutus put it. The states are now subject to no such actions to be able to be sued for these notes. All contracts entered into by individuals with states were made upon the faith and credit of the states and the individuals never had in contemplation any compulsory mode of obliging the government to fulfill its observations. So he thought that this would lead to some kind of a windfall. And Paul explains it like this at SMU. Those who had previously purchased state debts, and maybe there was something, I don't actually know the history about this state debt nearly as much as I should. I really should look into it because a lot of it drove Hamilton's mercantilist, nationalist, central bank supporting economic vision. 
And so assuming these debts created a serious problem for decentralization and federalism. So people had previously purchased these debts, Paul Wright, took a risk whether the state would later pay the debt, and that risk affected the considerations paid for the debt. For those of you who understand financial instruments, the greater the risk, the greater the potential return, the likelihood is that you pay less for it, but there's a greater chance that you're going to lose all of it, never get, get it back, but maybe you can double, triple, 10x your money. So if there's a guarantee that another entity is going to force them to pay, then you're getting a kind of a windfall out of this. You're being guaranteed that you're going to pay. You took on a risk that someone is saying is no longer a risk. So someone's getting off pretty rich here, and I wonder who that was. Uh, Paul goes on, he says, with no way to compel states to, to pay, the debt was worth less than it would otherwise be. By authorizing suit against a state in federal court, the proposed constitution added a valuable right to that pre-existing debt the right to have a neutral tribunal compel state performance. If such a right existed at the time of contracting, at the time when someone bought those bonds, those debts, whatever we want to call them, the state debt would have commanded a higher price. So these people were able to get in at bottom dollar. In some situations, it was like 10 cents on the dollar to buy these. And then they got rich out of it. Thus, federal diversity jurisdiction over states would award current debt holders who are largely out of state a windfall. And Jason puts it this way over at uh, Founder of the Day. This debt issue and suing in the courts and getting a windfall for people, coupled with the federal government taking a substantial portion of the tax revenue, as discussed in his sixth paper, would lead to all the states falling into bankruptcy and becoming hopelessly dependent, he says on the states, but I think on the central government. So he expected the states to become financially dependent on the central government. Now, maybe it didn't play out exactly like he predicted it, but certainly today, almost everything the states do, we're always concerned, well, how much federal funding is involved in this? And why is it federal funding when it's federal stealing? There, This is a kind of a shell game. They're ripping us all off. That should be another episode on its own anyways. Here from Constitution Center, we're moving forward to paper number 14. That's generally the thrust of the 13th paper discussing. There's actually a third issue that Paul McGreal discusses in SMU Law Review. Of course, I will link to that paper in the show notes so you can read to it, read it in full detail. But here at Constitution Center, they say, according to Brutus number 14, the problem of appellate jurisdiction is, quote, one of the most objectionable parts of the Constitution. He says it is a new and unusual thing to allow appeals in criminal matters contrary and dangerous to the lives and liberties of citizens who have a right to a fair and impartial trial by, ju by a jury of their peers. Brutus took the position that once you had a jury trial, that that was done. And he was concerned that people would be able to appeal to a federal court after a jury trial was held on a state court. Superior tribunals, they write over at uh, Constitution Center, can re-examine all the facts and law. Frequently, new facts will be introduced. So then the Supreme Court can revisit all the merits of the case. So, ooh, double jeopardy kind of concerns. And here's how Brutus put it. As our law now stands, a person charged with a crime has a right to a fair and impartial trial by a jury of his country, and their fi verdict is final. If he is acquitted, no other court can call upon him to answer for the same crime. Sounds similar to what became the Fifth Amendment. We know that some anti-federalists, probably a very small number of them, opposed ratification of the Constitution in all situations. Very, very few of them were actually on board with saying, everything's great under the Articles of Confederation, let's keep it exactly how it is. There are not many of those. Most of the people who were considered anti-federalists wanted to see either different proposals or they were saying we don't approve of ratification as the constitution as it now stands that's what they were that was their phrase for saying we want to see amendments primarily a bill of rights and this is one of the arguments that was carried all over the place this notion of you can't have another court call on someone for the same crime once they've gone through the jury trial the trial by jury here, Brutus continues, but by this system, a man may have had ever so fair a trial, have been acquitted by ever so respected 
as respectable a jury of his country, and still the officer of the government who prosecutes may appeal to the Supreme Court. And Jason over at Founder of the Day notes that this is really pleading the fifth. Brutus points out that giving prosecutors the ability to appeal criminal cases meant that people could continue being tried for the same crime over and over again. Brutus was incredibly influential. He was not the only one writing this type of approach, but he was very influential in pushing this message. Jason continues, he argues that the original case should be considered fair, so why should prosecutors have a second shot? These ideas rang true and found their way into the Fifth Amendment in the Bill of Rights. Now, we know that starting in Massachusetts during the ratification debates uh, in January and February, they were saying they were going to lose ratification. Once Massachusetts was going to fall, they were assuming that New York, which was on the fence, was gone and probably Virginia as well. The Sons of Liberty ended up making a deal saying, OK, Samuel Adams, John Hancock and others worked with people like Theophilus Parsons and said, OK, we'll get on board as long as we can recommend a series of amendments. I should actually look. I always mention that in Massachusetts, the First Amendment that they recommended is a precursor to what became the Tenth Amendment. John Hancock was a very strong tenther. So was Samuel Adams. He repeatedly wrote to people like Elbridge Gerry, Richard Henry Lee in Congress after uh, ratification saying, we got to get this amendment, this line in the sand. I'm curious what they had regarding the Fifth Amendment. I should look into that. Or if someone actually knows, uh, we can probably just look up the ratification document. But this became part of the Bill of Rights. This was part of the discussion here. And it was because people like Brutus and other anti-federalists said, we're concerned about this. We wouldn't have a Fifth Amendment if it wasn't for them saying that. And uh, Jason continues. He says, while we usually remember the phrase pleading the fifth as a means to not implicate oneself, it also includes the right that, quote, no person shall be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. That's the argument. Of course, the Federalist supporters of the Constitution were saying they don't have this power. You're concerned about nothing. But enough people were also concerned that this might play out like this, that it actually ended up being ratified as the Fifth Amendment. Here again from Brutus, he says they may now. It's not just the Fifth Amendment. We can also compare what he says here, which I'll read, and with what became the Sixth Amendment as well, also in his 14th paper, Part 1. He says, People may be kept in long and ruinous confinement and exposed to heavy and insupportable charges to procure the attendance of witnesses and provide the means of their defense at a great distance from their places of residence. Compare that with what became the Sixth Amendment. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district because they didn't. He was concerned like, oh, if you can just appeal this to a federal court, we don't know what kind of tribunals they're going to set up. Will there be federal courts in various regions? This is going to harm the poor. How can they travel to the capital of the country in order to have an appeal? Well, no. Here in the Sixth Amendment, they made it very clear, like, OK, you're going to have in a criminal prosecution in the state and district where the crime was committed. So if you happen to be traveling and committing a crime, then you're going to have to tra pay to travel again to go to court. But uh, what they were concerned about was sending people far away. And then this meant that justice would only be available to the rich. Uh, maybe in some ways, only if you can afford the people who understand the years and years and years of case law and garbage means that really it's up to the rich anyways these days. But this was a huge concern. Again, an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, the Sixth Amendment, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Brutus was really kind of concerned, and Saul Cornell, a historian who's kind of very good at history but loves the idea of a living, breathing constitution, he's written a lot about anti-federalism and the anti-federalist views. He felt, uh, I'm going to get into a paper that he discussed as well, that there was either a constitution for the common person, the average people, the middling sort was the phrase, or there was a constitution for lawyers. And I've mentioned this regarding some of his arguments in previous papers. He's saying, like, look, I know that this is the legal meaning of a particular phrase, for example, necessary and proper clause or general welfare. 
But sometimes even the lawyers today, the James Wilsons and others, debate a little bit about that meaning. Meaning, if this is a document from the people, we have to go with what the most common view is. And he really, really was one of the leaders of what we look at today as originalism, which is understanding the original meaning, the original understanding of the people who gave the document legal force. So Brutus was very influential there as well. So going into part two of his paper, here's Jason of his 14th, Jason at Founder of the Day, says Brutus further elaborates on the difficulty in travel and expense that he predicted would arise under the system. He believed this would disproportionately hurt, as Brutus put it, quote, the poor and middling class of people who in every government stand in most, most in need of the protection of the law. Here from Saul Cornell, he says, Brutus clearly believed that the state courts would act differently from federal courts. Dominated by men of the middling sort, the more average person, not the kind of top legal expert, the few of them that are out there, whose interpretive methods would focus on public meaning rather than orthodox Blackstonian search for intent. So old school originalism, a lot of times, especially up until maybe the 70s or so, 1970s, people felt that if you wanted to understand the original legal meaning of the Constitution, you just had to understand what the goal, the intent in the mind of the framers. Now, that could leave you a really wide swath of power if you looked at someone like Hamilton, who may have said one thing regarding limiting federal power during the ratification debates because he was a scammer and willing to change his view. But then his intention was actually far different. And we see how that played out. For example, all of a sudden he was on board with implied powers when he wanted a national bank. So intent doesn't actually give us the legal meaning of a document. That was kind of from a Blackstonian tradition, but it's not how we actually look to the legal meaning of any contract, of any compact, of any legal document. The words in a legal document mean today the same thing that they were understood to mean at the moment by the people who gave them legal force at the moment it was given legal force. So if we want to understand the legal meaning of the Constitution using the Brutus method as well, then we have to actually understand the debates back and forth, how the general public looked at these things. Anyways, dominated by men of the middling sort in the state courts, state courts would per better protect the people from depredations they were likely to suffer at the hands of an elitist judiciary. A little class warfare going on here. Interesting. He wrote approvingly of the recent history of state judiciaries, which he believed had shown considerable restraint opposing paper money laws. Of course, as I was mentioning, this whole issue with assuming debts and suing states and then having paper money coming out there. Here he's saying in Rhode Island, the courts were actually on board with the people opposing paper money laws. Now, we shouldn't actually structure a system based on recent performance of government agents. And I think he gets into that as well. So they were opposing paper money laws, legal tender acts, and other pro-debtor actions. Indeed, even in Rhode Island, he says, the judges there gave a decision in opposition to the words of the statute on this principle, that a construction according to the words of it would contradict the fundamental maxim of their laws and constitution. So they weren't just upholding a statute because that was written in law. They were saying this is opposing the fundamental principles of the constitution of the state of Rhode Island. And here again, this is, I think, back to, um, I think this is back to Saul Cornell. Yes. He says, Brutus did not favor state courts because they would be pro-debtor or less sympathetic to the rights of property. He favored them because he thought them more likely to be stocked with judges like himself. Now, he wasn't a judge. He wasn't a lawyer. If we assume that he was John L Williams or probably Melanchthon Smith, but men, he writes, who had demonstrated their commitment to the rule of law. That's what he was expecting on the state court level. But were not overly legalistic in their cast of mind. These types of judges would be more sympathetic to the concerns and ideals of the middling sort, the broad yeomanry and industrious artisans whom he believed were the most likely groups to be disadvantaged by the triumph 
of the Lawyer's Constitution. This is a really, really interesting paper. Of course, I will link to it in the show notes so you can read it in full. There's a lot of stuff that you'll probably find in there if you believe in the original legal meaning of the Constitution that you don't like, but there's also some very interesting history. Some years ago, uh, a lawyer friend of mine really kind of, she lambasted me. We're out on a run together, and she lambasted me for not reading enough from my opposition. I was telling her, I don't, this is just a quick side story, quick anecdote. I wasn't doing enough at the time to understand how the uh, opposing view thought. She's like, if you're going to look at these kind of legal experts and you don't spend time studying the ones who actually say a lot of stuff that you disagree with, you're selling yourself short because two things, maybe they'll have some other insight on stuff that's important to you, but also you have to learn how they think and how they approach things in order to defeat them. She's great in court. Anyways. Here back to Brutus. On all cases, where are we going with this one? <laughs> I'm not losing my place. So he also actually preferred, instead of doing this kind of appeals process, appellate jurisdiction on criminal cases, and then, of course, what we got out of that was the Fifth and Sixth Amendment, not just from Brutus, but this was, he was one of the most prominent writers discussing this stuff. But he also actually preferred using the English system of something called writs of error. You can search that if you want, but it's basically a process where you can have something reviewed with not, not, without always just having an automatic appellate jurisdiction. He says, on all cases which the laws of the union are concerned, he thought should have a writ of error instead of appellate jurisdiction, and perhaps to all cases in which a foreigner is a party. He said this method would preserve the good old way of administering justice, would bring justice to every man's door, and preserve the inestimable inestimable right of trial by jury. They were very concerned that this process would actually decimate the right of trial by jury. Unfortunately, today, we don't really have the kind of old school trial by jury. It's really a government mandated, government run, government controlled jury trial, which I've covered in a separate episode. Anyways, Brutus goes on, he says, it would be following as near as our circumstances will admit the practice of the courts in England using this writs of error, which is almost the only thing I wish to copy in their government. Now, a lot of the Federalists wanted to copy a lot from the executive power and other parts of the British system. And Brutus here is basically taking a complete opposite side. There's almost nothing he wanted. Of course, they fought a long, bloody war to get away from these people. Why would they want to bring parts into it? He's basically saying this part I'd like to keep in, but almost nothing else. Now, this is actually a piece from Niles Gilbertson from 2018 in Georgetown Law. He said, despite the anti-federalist, now this is a broader view that incorporates Brutus, despite the anti-federalist geographic, social, and at times ideological disparities, the defining characteristic of their political thought was the belief that if government gained the opportunity to consolidate power and oppress the people, it would. We've heard from Brutus over and over as we've gone through these papers. Do not give government power to do something which they might use to your injury. Don't give them power just because you're going to have good people administering government and they're going to do the right thing. Patrick Henry had the same type of argument over and over and over again in the Virginia ratifying convention in his very, very long, powerful speeches. Maybe that's what I should cover. I should do a series just on Patrick Henry's speeches if we're covering anti-federalist views. But Henry was basically saying, like, look, if you're going to tell me that the answer to my objections to the document, to the proposal, is that it's going to draw the best people in the country to office, this is nonsense. Because he said, show me that age and country where the rights and liberties of the people were based on, and I'm paraphrasing here, the sole chance of their rulers being good men without a consequent or subsequent loss of liberty. He said this happens every single time in history. So if you're just basing your system on the hopes that good people are going to be in charge, or you're going to somehow get the cream of the crop, the most moral people, he said in the long run, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. And that was a very strong anti-federalist approach because a lot of times the federalists we're telling us to rely on trusting that. Now, Benjamin Franklin, for example, he said, uh, I only expect to have good people administer this government for a number of, number of years, and then eventually we're going to have garbage because the people are going to want despotism. He also recognized that the people would demand the garbage. And in fact, today, when we look at all the stuff that we face, all the worst of the worst, there's always a significant number of people 
who want that, who beg for it, who plead for it, who ask for more. I don't know if it's Stockholm Syndrome or what it is. Anyways, back to Niles at Georgetown Law. He says, thus, the anti-federalist conception of politics derives from their view of human nature. This view is best expressed by Brutus's maxim while examining the judiciary here in paper number 14, part two, right at the end. He says the just way of investigating any power given to a government is to examine its operation, supposing it to be put in exercise. So anytime you look at a power delegated to the government, think how could they use it, not just how could a good person use it and just stay restrained like, oh, I have this power, but I'm not going to use it. How could someone in the future who wants to use it to its fullest use it? That would be an argument to have opposed things like the TSA and the Patriot Act and the income tax and the central bank. All these things that were told that weren't, weren't going to expand. They're just going to be used for this. The Patriot Act was just going to be used for the terrorists. This actually defies the anti-federalist view. What Bruce is saying right here in paper number 14 don't just think how the people that you like are going to use this power. Think how it's going to be used if it is put into exercise. He says, if upon inquiry, it appears that the power, if exercised, would be pre prejudicial, it ought not to be given. So if it's going to be bad, don't give them that power. If they can use it in a bad way, don't give them that power. For to answer objections, he writes, made to a power given to a government by saying it will never be exercised is really admitting that the power ought not to be exercised and therefore ought not to be granted. And that is a very, very important maxim. So many people, when they want to solve a problem, all they want is more centralized power and control. I'm going to force these people, like some kind of a libertarian dictator, I'm going to force these people to be free without thinking, well, if you actually support the precedent of someone doing this, you're also supporting some future person having that same power to do the opposite against you. So according to Brutus and the Anti-Federalists, we should always, always reject that stuff. And he was very concerned that the power of the judiciary, as we've seen over a number of papers, and we'll see probably just in one more episode on the 15th, would be just totally out of control and lead to a great national power, centralized, consolidated. He said, this court is to have power to determine in law and equity on the law and the fact. And this court is exalted above all other power in the government, subject to no control and so fixed as not to be removable, but upon impeachment, which I shall hereafter show is much the same thing as not to be removable at all. And he definitely called it on that one as well. Well, anyways, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. I hope you learned something. Of course, if you want to uh, learn a little bit more about Brutus's papers, of course, you can go to the show notes, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. You can look at the show notes for this episode to read the stuff that I referenced in full detail in context. And then also, if you scroll to the bottom of that page, our show homepage, the very bottom, there's an entire section where you can uh, look through all the different and scroll through all the different episodes that I've done so far. This is number 13 or something like that. Uh, and of course, I really appreciate you being here. Smash the like button, reviews on Apple Podcasts, subscription, notifications, all that stuff, especially on the mainstream platforms triggers the algorithm of the platform and tells them to show the program to more people, especially those uh, reviews on the podcast platforms. I really appreciate that a lot. And of course, our membership program starts out at just two bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Just want to take a quick look over in the chats and see if there's chat and see if there's any other questions. Andy Blue said, you guys should read Lysander Spooner's essay, No Treason. Of course, we do a lot of episodes actually covering uh, uh, Spooner. I've done work on his trial by jury, on his advice on how to defeat federal programs. In fact, just a few weeks ago, I did actually one of my most favorite episodes of all time, Spooner's strategy to defeat a usurpation taken from his great paper, 1850 paper, Defense for Fugitive Slaves. So it's uh, actually good stuff. Haji, 1954, said this Brutus did outstanding work. And I think Murray Rothbard, uh, in his great multi-volume history on uh, the American Revolution and Conceived in Liberty is what it was called. I think he referred to Brutus as really the most honest and most consistent, but uh, that's pretty interesting uh, approach. Deep South Granny said, thanks, dude, you're awesome. 
back to you. I really appreciate it. And I think I'll take a look over in the chat a little bit later today. If you've got questions or comments or ideas for future episodes, or you've got thoughts about what other anti-federalists or even other federalist series that I should cover outside the federalist papers, because everyone covers that and they're given way too much influence in how we view the Constitution, uh, please let me know. You can also email me at team at 10th Amendment Center dot com. Again, I really appreciate being here. I hope you had a great weekend. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I will see you next time here on the path to liberty.